Well, it was over 29 years ago uh, that Rabbi Paul Silton, the founder, uh, hosted Holocaust survivors who were testifying against Willis Hosner in the first trial of a Nazi war criminal held by the U.S. Justice Department. And Willis Hosner was the war criminal. Uh, Willis Hosner was an accused war criminal who had forced 250 men, women, and children into a synagogue and set it on fire in Latvia. Right. And. Um, he started a study group in the late 70s, and in 1984, he held uh, the first conference on the prosecution of Nazi war criminals in America, and 1,500 people came. And that's when I became involved, because I was shocked that there were Nazi war criminals living with impunity in the United States. And so it was founded to educate about the work of the U.S. Justice Department Office of Special Investigations. We published two magazines, uh, Justice magazines on the subject. We held an exhibition. Um, and we supported the OSI um, in their efforts to prosecute Nazis who came to the United States illegally. One thing, and I've said this to you before, I don't understand how men and women could go to work every day and murder little children, murder grandparents, murder invalids just because they were Jewish and then go home at the end of the work day and help the kids with their homework or like, hey, what are we gonna do for the weekend? How? Well, that, that does not compute. There's been many books about the psychology of mass murderers and the psychology of a country that adopts a genocidal policy. In other words, you have to turn around your people who are wonderful, religious, hardworking people and convince them that there's an enemy that has to be murdered. And to do that, I always like to quote um, uh, a general, Otto Oldendorf, who was head of um, a mass murder group when they used to do it with by shooting the people in pits, the Einsatzgruppen. Right. He was head of a unit, and he at his trial testified, how could you kill small children? And he said small children, even infants, would grow up to be the enemy of the country. So if we want to protect our democracy, we always have to educate about how a country uh, taught prejudice that led to genocide, and that's what we've done for all these 29 years. The Education Center sends Holocaust survivors to schools to share their stories in many, many different countries as children. What happened? What was it like before the Holocaust? We always like to show family pictures. And what could possibly be that you would murder someone's 75-year-old grandmother or murder a baby? We held the French Children Exhibit at Union College to show these children who were rounded up and sent to their deaths. Because that education will protect our own country, our own democracy. Well, I know uh, Joseph Goebbels would do a very interesting thing. He would take the current top 40 hits of the time in Germany, and he would have artists re-record those songs. They sounded exactly like the hit recording, but they would be filled with anti-Semitic lyrics, and he would do the brainwashing on the radio day after day after day. Well, that was the propaganda ministers did that as well. Um, and I think, I think that education and the, and the films they prepared helped um, tell the society that there was an enemy. But the odd thing is, 14,000 Jewish Germans, or German Jews, fought in World War I for Germany. Yeah. Many, many, many decorated officers. Um, but yes, there was a propaganda ministry, and yes, they did that, and published newspaper stories. But people inside had to have some antipathy towards their neighbors, or what we like to share every year are stories of those who rescued uh, Jews and others who were sought by the Nazis. Well, if I recall, uh, wasn't Anne Frank, a diary of Anne Frank fame, wasn't her family turned in by a neighbor to the Nazis? No. Um, uh, Anne Frank okay. went into hiding. Her right. family, she was a child at the time, uh, went into hiding uh, above the business that her father had right. run, had to give over <clears throat> to the non-Jewish employees when it was Aryanized. And Meep Geese, who was here in 1996, she you only died a few years ago, um, she she and others hid them in the Prinzengracht place where the Anne Frank house is today, right. upstairs. And um, in essence, 
uh, a neighbor said something suspicious was going on there, and yes, but they were able to hide there for a long time until August of 1944. Um, so yes and no. Yes, somebody okay. did turn them in for suspicious behavior for money, um, but um, they were able to hide for quite a while there. As you know, uh, Justin Bieber recently uh, visited Anne Frank's house and uh, said that he hoped had she been alive today that she would have been a believer and a lot of which is what a Justin Bieber fan is called and a lot of people are distressed about that your reaction to Justin Bieber well actually the whole discussion is nonsense you know because somebody made a joke and the Anne Frank house said you know they weren't offended but they you know right uh, I think obviously he didn't take it's seriously he and he's in his self-absorbed nature um, but the interesting part of such a silly nonsense is that yes people did think more about the Anne Frank house um, and I have many friends there because we sponsored five Anne Frank exhibits here at the College of St. At the, Rose. At College of St. Rose we sponsored um, one at the Albany JCC and the Schenectady JCC with the FBI had a traveling exhibition that we joined together with them but we had very large exhibitions at the College of St. Rose and then the French Children at Union College and we were at Siena College as well which is interesting you know that um, anti-prejudice education which the Anne Frank exhibits highlight um, is very very important to many colleges of many different kinds in our community and I think what we know is that Anne Frank's story has a resonance um, we have a whole selection of diaries and memoirs, many of them for of younger children. Right. But Anne Frank's story has a resonance, including the updated version, um, of what her thoughts were as a young person. And on her walls, which was brought out when this whole Bieber nonsense came out, she had pictures of movie stars of the time, and perhaps we could look at those and realize that she might not have liked Justin Bieber. <laughs> But that's all, of course, silly nonsense. Do you have any of Justin Bieber's CDs? Uh, that's uh, another silly, or? nonsensical question. <laughs> well, since I was me. introduced <laughs> as a teacher and a scholar, but yes, I have other. I don't <laughs> collect those. Um, but then again, um, perhaps different kinds of music. I I like many different kinds of music, but we could talk about something more serious, of course. Well, this horror all started in uh, 1938 with uh, Crystal Knock, right? No, it started before that. Okay. So the the most most important thing to remember about the Nazi period, and I think that's what we like students to understand, is that Hitler was elected to office. Okay. So Adolf Hitler ran for office um, uh, before he finally won the position, and under their form of government, a uh, parliamentary system, he was able to become chancellor, because, but with only 37.4% of the vote. So that's why our democracy is so important. Remember, learn about who you're voting for. Don't think that someone else is going to take your uh, unbelievable uh, honor to be able to vote and do it for you. Always learn who the people and the positions of the people running, even for the smallest offices. So Adolf Hitler's positions are well known. He wrote Mein Kampf in the 20s. Right, in prison. And the, the Depression came, and he couldn't win then. But by 1932, he was able to garner that portion of the vote, partially because the country was so divided. There was a, uh, you know, they used to say that you could wallpaper the walls with the money because it was worth so little. So once the 30s came and um, people feared a communist takeover at the time, Hitler was able to garner that percentage of the vote and the chancellor at the time appointed him. And so people thought they could control him, but it's very serious. You need to learn how uh, different groups felt that supporting him might bring stability to the country, but they could control him, which they were wrong about. So in essence, he was able to outmaneuver the Chamber of Physicians, which supported him, the military, which supported him, because they feared the other possibilities. And then eventually he took control. He caused enough chaos, burned down the Reichstag, and caused enough chaos to say, well, I need absolute power. And after that, it was very difficult. And so, uh, in essence, um, his years of reign till 1945 um, are evidence that um, you always need to care about your vote. It started um, 
it did start with his regime, but the first big public thing was the crystal knot, right? That was no, actually, the, or was that, the, the public the thing. Now? That was the first violent. We usually say the day the Holocaust began, yeah. the days are Kristallnacht, because that's when thirty thousand Jewish men and boys were arrested and sent to prison, and when um, synagogues were burned and businesses were burned. So it's the night of the broken glass because they broke um, windows. But really, the Nuremberg laws of the of nineteen thirty five took away the right. So from the time he was put in office, uh, I usually like to tell students the train was rolling because the rights of individuals were taken away. The first concentration camp was uh, opened within months of his taking power. Which, what was the first one? And the first one was Dachau. Okay. And so then, now, there was a big uh, news flash, but most of us knew about this, of a map of how many camps there really were. We know of the, you know, everyone knows of the six death camps in Poland, but most people don't realize that the concentration camp system and the violence and the uh, starvation and the slave labor was all over Germany and the areas they controlled. Isn't there uh, some documentation that recently has come out within the past six or seven months where they have documented what you said and they've listed yes. more uh, concentration camps that were not really that high profile? Well, absolutely. And so when you see the map that used to hang, there a map like that hung over Eli Rosenbaum's desk. I'll never forget that at the Office of Special Investigations. And it is shocking you know, the, how many there were. And that showed that basically the Nazi government in, in the countries they occupied, as well as in Germany, they basically had instituted this kind of slave labor system everywhere. Theresienstadt, my understanding of Theresienstadt was Hitler was getting bad PR around the world. And they took, he took the people of Jewish descent that were prominent and they were taken to Theresian side of the world was told that these people are Jewish prominence and they're living in a happy land in Theresian side which was not the case and the Red Cross came to Theresian side and said wow Hitler's taking care of these people it's a wonderful place did a movie on it and uh, Hitler uh, duped the Red Cross is that is that sort well, of the story? A simplified version. Yes, because he try, they were forced, the inmates of uh, Terezin, Terezinstadt, that's okay. what they called it in the town of Terezin, were forced to clean up the camp and make it look, and they were forced to perform. And um, a famous composer uh, trained uh, individuals that was just on television on a public broadcasting magnificent program um, trained the people with one score to perform Verdi's Requiem and within that in Latin and so the the individual musicians did not have the score in front mm -hmm. of them they had to memorize every single word and when people were deported they had to get trained new people to perform Verdi's Requiem in Latin and in that, they talked about the Nazis, and of course the Nazis didn't know about what they had done. So, and the magnificence of all of this is that we had um, showed a film uh, about a survivor, a uh, young girl, who died in, in Terezin. Well, she died in Auschwitz, she was right. deported. And the Bradys, the brother and sister, the brother survived and lives in Toronto. And the wonder of all of this is that many people survived, but also that Hitler was exposed later. The Red Cross was duped. They were forced to clean up the camp to call it a ghetto for the Jews and all the famous right. composers and, and people were there to pretend. And then later they were deported. So I think the story today is continued because they repeated the Verdi Requiem in Terezin, in the site of the camp, and it was magnificent. And one of the survivors was there and his two sons sang in his place. So the amazing thing is that we have this horrible history and, um, and we take that history and we look at it and we say to ourselves, what can we do to make a better world? And so the people in Czechoslovakia restaged it and educate today about the horrors of Theresienstadt.